So the, the Kansas Master Naturalist is looking at life in the entire state of Kansas. It's not just limited to Ponta Prairie. We're looking at the entire state. And I like this particular picture because it shows the, the change in the color from the west on the east side. And that insinuates that the western Kansas is drier, central Kansas is moderate, and eastern Kansas is wetter. And that is indeed the case. But we'll talk about that. I can't believe that's Myron Calhoun. He looks a lot different. Oh, you guys can't see it. Okay. Myron's got a very young picture of himself up. Okay. So living organisms need food, water, shelter, and space. Understanding what your particular species needs allows you to better find them or locate them. So space involves habitat. Habitat is far more than just space. Habitat is the kinds of, of yep, I will admit you. Did I admit you? Let me go back up here. <coughs> is that you, Ken Stafford? Okay. So the kind of habitat is defined by the plants. And the kinds of plants are going to be defined by the types of soil and the type of precipitation. And the kind of uh, soil is going to be defined by the type of geology. And then the amount of habitat necessary to accommodate the life needs of that And the territory is going to be the range that is protected or defended by an individual. So the things that I'm trying to do, I think I'm getting feedback on you, Lisa. Maybe are you muted? I'm not connected to audio, but but. but. <laughs> One second, folks. We're just doing we're doing a little troubleshooting. I think we're good. If you want to make me co-host, I can also mute people and get them to the waiting room, handle those logistics. Not to like insert myself, but just to handle all of those annoying things so you can have anything. Done. Okay. Thank you. So the central location of Kansas allows us to have a unique opportunity to have a large number of different species represented within our area, simply because we're going to get those that may be Western in nature, those that may be Northern, those that may be Southern, and even some of those that may be Eastern. So we start with this, and you're going to see in your binders that you've got a laminated map of the precipitation of Kansas. Because precipitation is a huge part of the equation of where do you find life in Kansas. In the western part of Kansas, you've got drier areas. So in the orange, we get 16 to 18 inches of rain. As we move east, and we've got this dark purple over on the west, up to 46 inches of rain. So the amount of rain, the amount of precipitation, is not just rain, it's snow, ice, we're getting precipitation right now, frozen. All of the precipitation in a year indicated here on this map is going to affect what kind of organisms can live in certain areas. 
So keeping this with you will help you understand why some organisms will be found in certain places. Of particular interest is going to be this southeast corner of Kansas. The southeast corner is going to have species here that are found nowhere else. We'll talk about that. Other forms or other ways of accessing water, looking at underground water. So in Kansas, particularly Western Kansas, we have the aquifers. The entire system is the High Plains aquifer, but we have different branches of it. The largest branch being the Ogallala aquifer that extends, and I'll show you now how far it extends, up into Nebraska, down into Texas, the Great Bend Prairie portion of that aquifer provides water for Great Bend and the Arkansas River. It also provides water for uh, the Corbera National Wildlife Refuge. The Equus Beds provides water for Wichita. So here's the entire range of the Ogallala Aquifer. It's huge. And in some areas, it's very deep. This is a snapshot picture. The black squares show counties that have removed large amounts of the Ogallala Aquifer. This was in the year 2000. If this were to be updated, we would see a lot more dark black squares because the old Ogallal aquifer is being very seriously depleted. But it's part of the equation, it's part of the story. Where is there water and where is there not water? That's where we'll see light or not. Jill, I'm gonna pause you for just a second. Do you have, um, so everybody who's Zooming is seeing your PowerPoint whole selection of slides, they're not seeing which one you're talking about. I don't know if you have the ability to um, yep. either if, How about that? Uh, let's see. I think that should work, but let me, uh, oh yeah, that works, I see it. Good. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. <laughs> Troubleshooting. Sorry, Zoomers. We're getting it. We're figuring it out. Okay. Rivers. Kansas has some major rivers that completely affect where we're going to find life. The Arkansas River with the Great Bend in it. The Kansas River and then the branches, the tributary branches leading into the Kansas River. Um, we will see species along the rivers that we may not see very far away from them. So understanding the where the rivers are and the flows will help us understand where there'll be species. So the physiogeography of Kansas, the physical geography, and we'll talk a little bit here in a minute about the age and the layers. But knowing this, this map and the next one will really help you understand where to find things. Okay. Let's go ahead and go to the next one here. Okay. So we're in the, obviously, the Flint Hills uplands. We have the older layers of rock and soil to the east, younger ones to the west. We knew within the last 600,000 years, the Flint Hills uplands date back into the mid Permian, the 250 to 300 million years, but the Osage Quest is a quest of being a bridge with a gentle slope on one side and a steep slope on the other, or a spur. It's going to be even older. And then I mentioned the southeast corner, which is that 
that lime green in the corner. We'll talk about that. And we'll talk about this weird brown point coming up through the middle of the Osage questions. There's going to be species found only in those little parts, especially plants. So this is a great map of the geology of Kansas, very detailed, uh, wonderful map showing the wide variety of geology in Kansas, but it can be a little overwhelming unless you're a geologist. Now this map simplifies it. And for this, I'd like you guys to get out your geologic strata in your front page or front cover. You've got the geologic time scale. Laminated for you to use as a reference. On the geologic time scale, the yellow is going to be the Cenozoic era, it's going to be the most recent. And the pre Cambrian over on the far right is the oldest. So it goes in order from the newest on the left and the oldest on the right. We are at the very top of the Cenozoic. And actually, we're like the Anthropocene, but it's not on there. We're at like the very last minutes of the Cenozoic. So looking at this and comparing it to the generalized geology of Kansas, you can see the third column, the third era, Paleozoic, has at the top the Permian period. And the Permian period was between 250 and 300 million years ago. So the Permian system here, colored light blue, Flint Hills. 250 to 300 million years ago. Next, the Carboniferous. Carboniferous system with the Pennsylvanian subsystem, Mississippi subsystem. Purple, purple. Find it on here, that's going to be 300 million years ago to 350 million years ago, so even older. Look at the little corner I keep telling you about, southeast corner of Kansas. This is the Mississippi subsystem. Find it on your geologic time scale. Where is it? Anybody find it on there? There it is, Mississippian. Okay, so that's going to be 330 to 360 million years ago. The oldest. This is the oldest rock in the state of Kansas. Where did you find that? Below the red. Is it carboniferous? Carboniferous is the second part. It is the second period of the carboniferous. Are you the one that asked? It's written on, on the, oh, yeah. the side. Who asked? On the side. No, okay. Okay. See, I can't tell because there's going to be more now. Did you see it? Yeah. <coughs> All right, now let's go the other way. Let's find the green. Cretaceous. So the Cretaceous is that period of the Mesozoic. And that's going to be quite young, between 70 to 140 million years ago. Go over here to the tan. We've got the Holocene and the Pleistocene. So find the Holocene and the Pleistocene. Is there a town policy on here? It's at the very top of the center. Very top. Okay. Thank you. So we're talking only like maybe five million years old, one to five million years old. 
very young, medium, old, oldest. To understand the age of the rock in Kansas. So, so, so how come we skipped 60 million years in there for the Jurassic and the <coughs> That is an excellent question for you to ask when we have the geology lecture. So write that down and remember that. Okay. Elevation. Elevation is a huge part of the story as well. And here we're just seeing the relief map of the elevation of the United States. We see Rocky Mountains. The Appalachians on the east. We have the coastal cascades. And then we have the central relatively flat. But what we were seeing is the rain shadow of the Rockies on the western part of Kansas. And then the relief from the rain shadow in the middle, and then So the elevation of Kansas, the sunflower, we've been about sunflower. So Mount Sunflower, is it a mountain? Oh yeah. Is it? <laughs> Oxygen required. <laughs> is, is it a bump? Okay, so number one, highest elevation in the state. Lowest elevation in the state, or seven. So we're sloping downhill as we go from west to east. Just some other points of interest, number two is liberal. Number three, geographic center of the United States in Kansas. Number four, Great Bend. Five is Wichita. Six is Topeka. Yeah, this is a great map. This will allow you to kind of visualize where things are and what is affecting life in those places. Um, and then taking a look at the scale, we go from the high. <laughs> Ken's going to start laughing again. We go from high of 4,039 feet, way up here at number one, all the way down to 679 feet on the east. Granted, no, one, no one's going to get dizzy with the change, with the elevation change, but it's Kansas is not flat. Okay. Eco regions. Eco regions help us to wrap our heads wherever we are. And in looking at eco regions, it's kind of like starting with a microscope and starting under very broad view and becoming slowly more focused and closer in. So ecoregions, and this I'm following the US EPA designation for ecoregions. And we're starting with level one. So level one ecoregions, they say that there are 12 of them in the United States. And you can look at this map. And you can say, well, the great big area in the middle of the United States is what? The great big brown area in the middle of the United States is what? Prairie or grassland. The pale green in the eastern United States is going to be temperate. Deciduous forest. The brighter green in patches over here towards west, that's going to be your montane, your mountainous forest. What do you think the yellow is? But the number 10, what is the yellow? Desert. Yep, very basically desert. 
Then they called this in the Pacific Northwest, they call that like marine, marine forest. EPA has weird names. They're calling this like a uh, 15 down here in the tip of Florida, like a almost a rainforest, which is interesting. 11 on the far west of California, like a chaparral shrubland. Very, very basic, but we know, we know that Kansas is more complex than just this solid brown insinuates. So let's start zooming in. Okay. Let's go to the next level. We add a couple more colors here at equal region two. At this level of magnification, there are 25 eco regions. We see a little more complexity. Rather than just having plain old grasslands, we have different kinds of grasslands. Still pretty broad, still in Kansas, basically breaking it into the mesic grasslands on the east and the briar grasslands on the west. Pretty basic. We're probably going to get our most useful view at the next level, zooming in even further to level three. Level three ecoregions get a little more complicated. There are 105 of them in the United States. But here, I just zoomed in on Kansas. So we can see the ecoregions as defined by the EPA. And what you're going to see is basic breakdowns, basic different colors, shapes, borders that look familiar. We saw these in the in the geo physiology of Kansas. So the the sections of Kansas where we find different kinds of life are going to be defined by the elevation the geology, the soil, precipitation. And here they are seen again. Can you pick out the Flint Hills? Here's our weird little corner. And then coming up on the eastern edge of the Flint Hills, we have, oh, this is the Osage Cuestas we have this weird little point. Let's talk about that. That weird little point coming up from Oklahoma. That is the cross timbers. Okay, so here's the names of our ecoregions. We have the Flint Hills. Our Osage Cuestas are now called the Central Irregular Plains. Our weird little corner is part of the Ozark Highlands. Cross Timbers is the point that comes up. Down here in the south, we have Southwestern Tablelands. And on the west, we have the High Plains, meaning grassland at relatively high elevation. Oh, and this one's fun. What we would have called high quality, well, actually, in one, it was the glacial till. Here it's called the Western Corn Belt Plains. But that was actually where we had really good tall grass prairie that for the most part has been plowed. Another view of the eco regions. And here you can see weird little corner. Nah, glacial, and here's the cross timbers. Now I want to show you, there's the cross timbers outline from Texas, Oklahoma, into Kansas. I think it looks like a witch. A witch with her dupe so. Okay. What's interesting about the cross timbers, lots of things are interesting about it, other than it looks like a witch and her little pointy hat goes into Kansas. It is dominated by post oak and blackjack oak, so kind of short, scrubby trees. It is the boundary between deciduous forest and prairie. So we have completely different species 
to the east of this than we do to the west of it. The cross timbers provides a boundary between east and west going all the way up. Now, the kinds of things that we talk about a lot here are on this slide. We talk about the different kinds of prairie. And this is a very broad and generalized slide showing the tall grass prairie. And I think it's kind of generous here for Kansas. I don't know that the tall grass prairie goes that quite that far west. Mixed grass prairie in the central part of the state which would be defined as having both tall grass and short grass prairies, drier precipitation, higher elevation, and then the short grass steppe on the far western side, again, higher elevation, less precipitation, shorter grasses. Very basic distribution. So what does that matter? It matters where you're going to find different species. These are the ranges of medlarks. We've got two different maps because we've got two different kinds of medlarks. Remember, in Kansas, we see eastern species and we see western species, and we see northern, and we see southern. I saw an armadillo the other, well, not the other day, but it's been a couple months ago. <coughs> We're seeing more armadillos. I'm seeing white wing doves. We're seeing snowy owls. Jill, um, I recently heard of a moose making its way through Kansas. Yeah. Is that normal? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Who knows what his story is, right? Or her story. I don't know. Um, elk are normal. We had, I think we have an elk actually on site. There's tracks of an elk on site. So elk are normal, um, armadillos are not, moose are not, but there we go. So take a look, what do you think on this western, this is just a range map, this is a very generalized range map for Midlark. Why do you think the range of this Midlark extended out into these little fingers? What's up with those fingers? rivers exactly so remember i said rivers affect everything well not every that a lot of things so what med lark is this okay so we have the eastern med lark on the right and the western med lark on the left what do we have in kansas we have both and so when you see a med lark you just say that's a med lark but somebody will say, well, is it an Eastern or Western? Jackie, what do we need to do? Yes, you do. <laughs> you need to hear them sing. You need to hear them sing. Okay. And generally, girls don't sing very often. It's mostly the boys. And they're not, very, they're not gonna sing very often in the winter. Although they have been on nice days, I hear the men larks. So you'll learn during this, if you don't know the difference between an Eastern and a Western Metal Lark song, you're gonna learn that. And you're gonna learn how to remember that because the Western Metal Larks are caffeinated and the Eastern Metal Larks are drinking mint juleps. They're a lot slower and a lot laid back and the Western are not laid back at all, they're caffeinated. So an example of if you know your your ecoregions, it's going to help you understand where things are and why. Woodchuck. I got a woodchuck at my place. Jack, can you get a woodchuck? You got a woodchuck? You got a woodchuck? Where? I have a woodchuck. Yeah. Are we going to have them in Salina? Maybe. Probably not, it'd be weird. We are on the far western edge of the woodchuck range. 
But what do woodchucks like? Okay, we we if you know woodchucks, you know they like dandelions and gardens and digging holes and things. So they like deep soil with lots of moisture. Are they going to get deep soil with lots of moisture over here on the western part of the state? Not so much. Who likes the western part of the state? This guy does. They like the drier, uh, sagey parts of the state. They're not going to want the corn and the tall grass. I was going to put up the range of the white-tailed deer. <laughs> that just muddied the water because the white-tailed deer are everywhere. But the mule deer is a nice, clean line. They like the west. The woodchuck, nice, clean line, likes the east. So hopefully, this training will help you better understand the requirements for different kinds of life. Okay. So next week, we'll learn about where in Kansas we can see the different ecoregions, i.e. public places where we can go visit. A lot of you guys already know these things. Where can we go to see this stuff? Where can we go to see that weird little southeastern corner of stuff of Ozark? And we're going to learn how to effectively communicate what we know and see to other people. How to do interpretation. So this is where we end today's lecture. We're here in our room. We're going to take a break and we're going to come back and, and talk informally. But our Zoom audience, you can go ahead and exit and we will see you next week. Thank you for joining us.